Well, if we start at the level of the mitochondria, we know this is our source of ATP. That is our energy source. That's the energy source for every single cell. Study after study is showing, though, when we have mitochondrial dysfunction, this causes reactive oxygen species, and that's leading to chronic inflammation. You can see right there CoQ10, part of the electron transport chain. When we get deficiencies in CoQ10, such as when someone's on a statin, this reduces levels of CoQ10. That can lead to mitochondrial dysfunction. In oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondrial, electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, free radicals, they're just naturally generated. The thing is, do we have enough antioxidants to combat those free radicals in that oxidative stress? What happens is, if we have the mitochondrial dysfunction, that leads to the chronic inflammation, that creates more reactive oxygen species, and that leads to a constant cycle of chronic inflammation and more tissue damage. So what do we do to support the mitochondria? We gotta have the nutrients that the mitochondria will use to produce energy. It would be CoQ10, L-carnitine, magnesium, D-ribose, and certain B vitamins. If we have any nutritional deficiencies in any of those nutrients, we're gonna get mitochondrial dysfunction, we're gonna get inflammation, we're gonna get tissue damage. As I told you before, just normal oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria, that's gonna cause free radicals. So if we're deficient, and our antioxidants that counter those free radicals, we're gonna have mitochondrial dysfunction. So what are our antioxidants that are gonna counter these free radicals? Vitamins A, C, E. CoQ10 and L-carnitine, not only are they part of the mitochondrial electron transport chain producing energy, they in and of themselves are also antioxidants that counter the free radicals. Also, N-acetylcysteine, which is a precursor to glutathione. We know glutathione is our most powerful and abundant endogenous antioxidant. Also, antioxidants, we can be deficient in selenium, zinc, copper, manganese, very important minerals for our antioxidant defenses. Here's a research article talking about chronic oxidative stress and being deficient in reduced glutathione, and it's kind of like if we have a bank account and our withdrawals exceed our deposits, we have a deficit. Well, in the mitochondria, when we have mitochondrial dysfunction, when our reactive oxygen species, when they exceed glutathione, that's when we get a breakdown of the mitochondria. And again, that's when we get dysfunction, that's when we get chronic inflammation. Another research study here, this is where it talked about chronic inflammation, oxidative stress being associated with all those conditions, whether that's bipolar disorder, whether that's multiple sclerosis, whether that's Parkinson's, whether that's depression, autism, and chronic fatigue syndrome. They all have their root in oxidative stress and chronic inflammation. And I talked about that before. It's just a constant cycle. Again, oxidative stress, disrupted oxidative phosphorylation. We get activated inflammatory cells, that causes the tissue damage, that produces more reactive oxygen species, and the chronic inflammation persists. What I'm setting up for you here is where is this chronic inflammation starting from? If all of these conditions are rooted in chronic inflammation, what's causing the chronic inflammation? We're talking about mitochondrial dysfunction here, and I'll talk about alteration of gut permeability, leaky gut, that's caused by dysbiosis and abnormal pathogenic bacteria in the gut. So it talks about here, here's a study, many roads to mitochondrial dysfunction and neuroimmune and neuropsychiatric disorders. And you're going to find out as we go along here, nothing occurs in isolation. Somebody might have an autoimmune condition, but they're probably going to have a neurological condition along with that, whether that's anxiety, depression, motor tics, joint pain, you name it. All of these things go together. None of them occur in isolation. This talks about, again, elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines, your interleukin-1, your interleukin-6, and your tumor necrosis factor alpha. And what I'm going to talk about is that connection between the gut microbiota and the brain. Well, how does that happen? Through crosstalk between the vagus nerve and these inflammatory cytokines crossing the blood-brain barrier. This research article specifically focused on autism. What we've seen there 
is an increase in the pro-inflammatory cytokines. Again, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. And they also noted that you know, these findings, they were in the gastrointestinal tract. Again, we're finding the root of this in the GI tract where the chronic inflammation does begin. Autism, again, with this study, positive correlation between the severity of gastro gastrointestinal dysfunction and markers of oxidative stress. Study correlating mitochondrial dysfunction with autism. Here's the picture showing the GI tract. Our epithelial cells, and you can see right there, when those epithelial cells are damaged, whether that's pathogenic bacteria, whether that's undigested food antigens, chronic inflammation itself, that is going to set off those immune cells. It's gonna be kind of hard to see, but we have our mucosal immune system. So right underneath the lining of those epithelial cells, we're gonna have our mucosal immune system. You can see down there our macrophages, our dendritic cells, but look at those inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. With a lot of our autoimmune conditions, we've heard of the TNF-alpha inhibitors. And I tell people all the time, no matter how much you inhibit TNF-alpha, if you don't stop what's producing it, we're never going to solve the problem. You can inhibit TNF-alpha all day, but if you don't heal the gut, and what's causing that break in the epithelial lining, what's causing the gut permeability, what's causing the leaky gut, that is a predominance of pathogenic bacteria. The thing is, is we have a war going on in our GI tract. And whoever's winning that war, whether it's good bacteria, whether it's bad bacteria, that's gonna determine the health of our gut. That's gonna determine if we get the gut permeability and we get the infiltration of that pathogenic bacteria, undigested food antigens, and that is what's triggering the immune system. That's what's triggering the release of the TNF-alpha. That's what's triggering the release of the interleukin-6. Again, no matter how much we inhibit that, the inflammation will persist if we don't heal the gut lining. And we heal the gut lining by modulating it with more beneficial bacteria than pathogenic. I have a picture here of the enteric nervous system. It's considered our second brain. We have more neurons in our GI tract than we do our entire spinal cord. That's very, very important because the enteric nervous system is going to control contractions of the gastrointestinal tract, secretions, hormones, neurotransmitters. 90% of our serotonin is produced in the GI tract. Very important, a lot of hormones are produced there, even GABA, our inhibitory neurotransmitter, that's important for things like ADHD and other hyperactivity disorders. So here's a picture denoting the gut-brain connection. Again, we see the lining, the epithelial cells. We can see the immune cells intimately associated with that. Over there to the left, 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine, that is serotonin. We can see that serotonin being secreted by cells of the GI tract. A little bit over to the right, we have GABA. That's our inhibit, inhibitory neurotransmitter. And then you can see over to the right, the picture of the body, the vagus nerve. The red line there, that depicts the vagus nerve. That is our connection between the enteric nervous system of the gut and our brain is the vagus nerve. Also, these inflammatory cytokines, they are secreted into the bloodstream, crossing the blood-brain barrier, and that can affect the brain, leading to our neurological disorders. So I have on here, microbes maketh man, because microbes really do determine our health. I have on here to show you population gut, 100 trillion. We have 100 trillion bacteria in our GI tract compared to our 10 trillion cells. We have 10 times the amount of bacteria that we do cells in our body. We are mostly bacteria. So what do these gut bacteria do? They're antibacterial to pathogens. They decrease the adhesion of those pathogens to the epithelial lining. They produce vitamins such as B12, vitamin K2. They, again, they secrete hormones, neurotransmitters, and most importantly, what we're talking about, they're very anti-inflammatory. So the gut microbiome, again, it controls the immune system. Remember anything. We need the immune system to be upregulated, but not too much. That's how we get autoimmunity. We need to keep it in balance. And you can see there we have our anti-inflammatory cytokines, tumor necrosis factor, 
I'm sorry, transforming growth factor beta, TGF beta, and also interleukin 10. We have our pro-inflammatory cytokines once again, interleukin 1 beta, interleukin 6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. If we get an imbalance there, that's going to throw off the immune system. That leads to chronic inflammation. That leads to our autoimmune disease and even our neurological disorders. What causes the imbalance of the gut microbiota? So we keep tracing everything back. Everything's layers. We keep peeling back these layers. We can get to the cause of what's causing all of these conditions. Well, it happens in utero. It's all prenatal exposures. A lot of research studies now are showing whatever the mother was exposed to is affecting the child in utero. It's having a very, very big effect. Her microbiota, her gut microbiota, is affecting the fetus even when they're inside the womb. So here, antibiotics, that they're huge because not only do they kill good bacteria, the antibiotics are not only are they killing the bad bacteria, they're wiping out all the good bacteria too. And the problem is they don't kill all the bad bacteria, some bad bacteria are left to dominate. Again, a formula only diet. When I was in uh, med school in my internal medicine class, I did a seven page research paper on breastfeeding versus formula feeding. And the difference between the gut bacteria of those infants was unbelievable. It was such a drastic uh, difference. It was amazing because that gut bacteria, what it's gonna do is it's gonna modulate the development of that gut lining and the immune system. So this starts right after birth. So again, causes of pathogenic bacteria dominance, the antibiotics, uh, mode of delivery, C-section versus a vaginal birth. This is where the child's gonna pick up that, that bacteria from the mother, is through the vaginal canal. If you have a C-section, they miss out on that. And again, that gut bacteria is what's gonna help develop not only that GI lining, but their immune system too. Formula fed versus breastfed, talked about that. Immune system development, the gut bacteria having the greatest impact on it, especially in the first year of life. Here's a study here just talking about uh, human milk and the development of the, uh, the gut microbiome. Here's a study in the World Journal of Gastroenterology linking irritable bowel syndrome with aggression and um, pro-inflammatory states. That's what was causing this. Again, the cytokines, interleukin-1 beta and tumor necrosis factor alpha. And again, seeing a decrease in anti-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-10. And like I was saying earlier, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, they were linking that with anger, with anxiety. Again, because of an increase in those pro-inflammatory cytokines. So what can we do to repair the gut once damage is done? Well, things like L-glutamine. L-glutamine is the preferred fuel source for those enterocytes lining the gut. Also, our gamolson botanicals are very powerful at healing the gut lining, whether that's aloe vera, DGL, slippery elm, marshmallow, not the marshmallow you're thinking of, though. <laughs> uh, vitamin A, zinc carnosine, they're very effective at helping that epithelial barrier, those tight junctions. So we don't have the gut permeability, so we don't get the leaky gut. I want to kind of tie all this together, what I was talking about, with the chronic inflammation from mitochondrial dysfunction and from the alteration of the gut bacteria by showing you a case study. As I go through this case study, I want you to think what systems are involved with this individual to bring everything together. What, and it's going to show us why this individual was experiencing all of these different things. So we got a 20-year-old male, um, had right SI pain, um, got to the point to where he could barely walk. It was a sharp pain. Um, that was where it radiated from the low back uh, down to like the right gluteal muscle. There was also a dull chronic achy pain that was constant. This pain was about a 10 out of 10 to the point where this individual, like I said, could barely walk. Excedrin brought it down to about a nine out of 10. So this individual eventually, after a certain period of time, went and saw a sports medicine specialist. They took an X-ray. It showed degenerative changes on the right SI joint, sent this individual to a rheumatologist. So the rheumatologist, Diagnosed this individual with sacroiliitis, that's just inflammation of the sacroiliac joint. Put him immediately on three um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. When the effect of those wore off, 
eventually this individual was put on four Vicodin a day. That was in addition to the three non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Hopefully you're already thinking the side effects this would be causing, especially to the GI tract. Remember, we talked about the problem at the GI tract is where the chronic inflammation began. Periodically, oral high-dose steroids were given about four to five times a year. We know some of the side effects of um, corticosteroids, which can be you know, osteoporosis, can lead to fractures. Of course, increased risk of infections because we're depressing the immune system. This was over a course of seven years from the age 20 to 27. So you can imagine the effect not only in the GI tract, but the liver, again, the skeletal system. NSAIDs, what's the problem with NSAIDs? We know that they inhibit the COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes. That's because these enzymes create prostaglandins. That's our inflammatory mediators. This is what leads to pain. So why not just use them? Well, the problem is, is we need these prostaglandins because they produce mucus that coats our stomach and it coats our small intestine. This helps us from getting ulcers and it protects that GI lining. That's why when somebody can be on inset for a certain period of time, they will get that GI bleeding. So why don't we just inhibit COX-2 and leave the prostaglandins alone that are created by the COX-1? And that's exactly what they did with the COX-2 inhibitors like Celebrex. The problem with that is when, you, or Vioxx also, you might have heard of Vioxx, that was pulled off the market, thank goodness, because what happened is when they inhibited COX-2, everything was pushed to the other side. Well, not only does COX-1 produce prostaglandins that coat the GI mucosa, you can see there, it also leads to the formation of platelets that leads to blood clotting and vasoconstriction. So when everything was pushed down that pathway of COX-1, it started leading to heart attacks. Okay, people were out of pain, their arthritis got better, but they were dropping dead. Well, you don't feel much pain when you're dead. So that didn't do much good. So they took Vioxx off the market, thank goodness. Here we have NSAIDs and cardiovascular disease. That's what they're starting to find out now. A lot of this newest research, you can see that's from 2015. Well, not only are NSAIDs starting to cause cardiovascular problems, you can see part of the reason it talks about there is the role in reactive oxygen species. But we talked about that. So why don't we just use something like Vicodin or painkillers? They're very effective because at the level of the spinal cord, you can see there at the dorsal horn, and even at the level of the brain stem itself, where we have nerve transmission, these painkillers, they stop us from feeling that sensation of pain, like I said, at the level of spinal cord and the level of the brain stem. That's great, right? Well, they have their problems too. With our opioids, we see a lot of things, you know, dizziness, uh, even hyperalgesia. I came across a researcher who talked about opioids eventually, but their chronic use can lead to hyperalgesia. And hyperalgesia is an increased sensitivity to pain. Well, they're trying to block pain. The last thing we want is an increased sensitivity to pain. And then the worst, addiction. We see a lot of addiction with our opioid pain. With this individual, we had a lot of other things, not only with the pain, not only with the sacroiliitis, but we've seen extreme fatigue, anxiety, and headaches. So what was done? Again, so this is now, this individual seeing a primary care physician, was at a rheumatologist, got diagnosed with the sacroiliitis, now going to their PCP. So all the blood work was done, EKG was done, MRI in the brain, EEG, everything came back negative. This individual was diagnosed with anxiety attacks. Prescribed anti-anxiety medications, put on Ativan, and two to three different anti-anxiety medications. This patient took those anti-anxiety medications for about the course of a year. Eventually got off of them because the sedation and the blended affect was just too extreme. It wasn't worth it. The turning point came after seven years, this individual went back to the rheumatologist, and the rheumatologist said, sorry, there's no more I can do for you. You're way too young to put you on a higher dose of medications because it will ruin your liver. There's nothing else I can do. This individual was faced with the decision, death or chronic pain? Death, why? Because the medications will eventually ruin the liver. Got to have your liver, very important organ, or live in chronic pain. Well, what this individual decided to do was research natural therapies. Anti-inflammatory foods, supplements, exercise. Over the course of about a year, after implementing all of these therapies, these natural therapies, this 
individual who is now on their own wean themselves off all their medications. I don't advise doing that, but this individual had no choice. Again, left on their own. So now the average pain after this year of doing these natural therapies, you know, now we're about a six to nine out of 10, but the flare-ups would still occur twice weekly. And when the flare-ups would occur, the pain now is back to, you know, a 10 out of 10. During that time, during the flare-ups, taking about six to eight Excedrin a day. We know what these NSAIDs, again, can do the GI tract, but this individual is now on no prescription medications, which was a success for this individual after being on these medications for seven years. So after about one to two years of the natural therapy, the pain now goes down to about a four out of a seven out of 10. Um, you can see here the flare-ups, now they're only occurring about twice a month as opposed to twice a week. Over-the-counter Excedrin, again, during the flare-ups, the flare-ups, you know, would get so bad, this individual could barely walk, mind you, and especially the sleeping at night, the deep, deep spinal pain that occurs in this condition this individual had really disrupts sleep and causes a lot of pain. So, you know, these over-the-counter Excedrin were needed during those times, but there was occasional blood in the stool, and we know why that is. We know the damage is going on to the GI tract, causing the ulcers, causing the GI bleeding. But again, just to get by, just to walk and sleep, this individual had to take those. The diagnosis was eventually ankylosing spondylitis, and what we saw with this was extreme fatigue. This individual made a lot of progress in the pain reduction, but still had a lot of fatigue. When this individual started to research and started making progress, is when he found out the link between the gut inflammation and the joints. That's the thing. We not only do we have the gut brain connection, we have the gut joint connection. That's why we see with this chronic inflammation, the damage to the gut, not only we see our neurological problems, but our chronic inflammatory diseases. We see our autoimmune disease, again, ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis. And they're finding out you don't have to have overt digestive symptoms individuals will have no digestive symptoms at all, but there still is a subclinical gut inflammation going on, meaning there's inflammation in the gut, but they don't have to have any digestive symptoms. So the patient fit the picture 100%, 100% with the AS, um, restricted breathing in the rib cage, all the labs came back confirming that. And again, finding out the link between microbial pathogens and the gut inflammation. This is what empowered this individual the most, is when he discovered that link. Uh, the nutritional intervention was to stop feeding the pathogenic bacteria. We got this pathogenic bacteria in the gut, we have our good bacteria in the gut, which one are we feeding? You've gotta stop feeding the pathogenic bacteria, we gotta start feeding the good bacteria. That's gonna heal the gut lining, that's gonna shut off the chronic inflammation, and that's why this individual made progress. They heal their body at the level of the gut, and what I took you through is that's what's producing the chronic inflammation. They stopped suppressing it, they stopped inhibiting it, and they got to the source of the chronic inflammation. Symptoms and pain improve even more. Now there's flare-ups, they're about once a year, and the pain's about a three to a five out of a 10. You can see just constant progression as this individual got to the source of the problem and started healing and providing the body the most basic building blocks, we get constant progression. So what could have been done different? As I took you on this journey, well, you can see that this individual was looked at at the level of the joint. By a rheumatologist, diagnosed with dysagreliitis with the chronic inflammation. Then had the symptoms of the fatigue, the anxiety, all the other things. Was sent to the PCP, put on the anti-anxiety medications. Well, what could have been done different is that this could have been investigated further, taking more time, digging into this history. And if that would have happened, you would have found out from the age of 10 to 31 years old, this individual suffered from severe digestive issues, but this was never looked at. Also, from those that time, 10 years old to 31 years old, fatigue, lack of mental clarity, difficulty concentrating, and lack of coordination. Again, what do we have an in interplay here of the GI tract, of the immune system, and the nervous system all coming together in one individual. And that explains why we have all the different symptoms. Here is research backing up why this individual made so much progress and why this inflammation is happening at the level of the gut and goes to the joints and the brain. 
we have our molecular mimicry. I'm going to show you a picture that depicts that very well. Right here. So what we have right here is the amino acid sequence of bacteria and amino acid sequence of our self-antigens, whether that's at the level of the joint or collagen itself. And some of these chronic inflammatory diseases, these autoimmune diseases, they are attacking collagen in the joints or brain tissue itself. But what happens in molecular mimicry is we have the gut bacteria. We talked about how that disrupts the GI lining. That produces a chronic inflammation. That produces these autoantibodies. Well, these autoantibodies, not only are they triggered to attack that gut bacteria, but then they're triggered to attack our own tissues. And again, you can see on there, that's because our tissues, these gut bacteria, share a very similar molecular sequence. So these autoantibodies, they think our tissues, they think it's the bacteria. But again, that's happening at the level of the gut. And it says here, antibodies are produced in extra articular regions. That just means regions other than the joints. Articular is the joints. And where are these extra articular regions? Again, that's at the level of the gut, such as the enteric mucosal lymphatic system before gaining entry into the joints, binding the synovial tissues, and that comes from the gut flora causing gut inflammation. The World Journal of Gastroenterology research article here, again, talking about how TNF-alpha Remember that pro-inflammatory cytokine being produced at the level of the gut from intestinal permeability. Treatment of rheumatic manifestations and inflammatory bowel disease. Well, rheumat rheumatic diseases usually are attacking the joint, happening at the level of the joint. Our IBD there is our inflammatory bowel disease. They are integrally linked, our rheumatic conditions and inflammatory bowel diseases. But again, it doesn't have to be overt inflammatory bowel disease where you're experiencing the digestive issues. Remember, we can have that subclinical gut inflammation too, where you've got inflammation in the gut, but not necessarily the digestive symptoms. The thing is, the problem is here, and what this research article talked about, is a lot of the treatments for these conditions, these chronic inflammatory or autoimmune conditions at the level of the joint, whether that's corticosteroids or NSAIDs, they themselves damage the gut. That causes chronic inflammation, that will make it continue to persist. So the very treatment that's trying to stop these conditions is actually causing the inflammation that's allowing these conditions to perpetuate. And again, that's why that individual made progress being able to get off of those medications. Again, healing the gut, stopping that chronic inflammation at the source. Here's more research. Um, talking about NSAIDs, that they don't stop the joint destruction, but actually what they're doing is producing small intestine um, damage, which again is perpetuating that chronic inflammation. And it shows here if we modulate that intestinal flora, if we feed the good bacteria, if we can replace with good bacteria, that has an anti-inflammatory effect and most of all improves the quality of life. And that's what this individual started to experience more and more of as time went on. How many individuals you know have a chronic condition and they increasingly get better. I don't know too many. Most people have a condition, whether on medications or not, and they increasingly get worse. Well, this individual increasingly got better. Also, if the history would have been looked at even further, they would have found out from 10 years old, 18 years old, this individual experienced a lot of neurological issues, even motor and vocal tics. And again, we have the interplay, not only of the GI tract, the immune system, but of our nervous system. Again, we got the enteric nervous system linked to the central nervous system, the brain, from the vagus nerve. This is a lot of research talking about GI, dis GI diseases being linked to our neurological issues such as anxiety and depression. It says right here, GI diseases along with their comorbidity of depression and anxiety and up to 80% of patients they were showing an alteration of microbiota, and that affects the central nervous system function. Right here, you're talking about um, inflammatory cytokines crossing the blood-brain barrier. We talked about that. And it talks about here, the brain receiving hormonal signals from these cells in the GI tract. Remember what we talked about before? We have the enteric nervous system there and we have in the GI tract neurotransmitters and hormones being released that have an effect on the brain. Now, whether that's inhibitory neurotransmitters like GABA, we also have serotonin. Well, of course, if we're gonna have damage and inflammation of the gut, we're gonna have a decrease in that serotonin. That's been linked to depression. We're gonna have a decrease in GABA. We have a decrease in inhibitory neurotransmitter. 
again, we're going to have our hyperactivity disorders such as ADHD. And it talks about that bidirectional talk, again, the gut-brain axis, enteric nervous system, the brain being linked by the vagus nerve. And I love what it says. I starred that there in the bottom. That study, right in that research article, by modulating microbiota, you may modulate the mind. And again, things like depression, anxiety. I, I encourage individuals all the time, go to PubMed.gov and just type in gut microbiota and any neurological condition you want to look up, especially depression, especially anxiety, autism, ADHD. It's right there about the gut-brain connection. The research is there. It's very, very abundant. So what is this patient's current treatment and health status? Well, what a very individualized nutritional protocol to do what? To heal the gut lining and to support the mitochondria. What that's going to do is that's going to shut off that chronic inflammation because would we say that chronic inflammation is coming because of a damaged gut and it's coming because of mitochondrial dysfunction. So again, for mitochondrial support, again, those building blocks for energy production, that L-carnitine, that CoQ10, that D-ribose, that magnesium, certain B vitamins, if those building blocks are there for mitochondrial support, we're going to have energy production. And that's why this individual doesn't have that chronic fatigue anymore because their energy production was supported at the most basic level. So where is this individual currently? Well, from age 27, remember I said from age 20 to 27, this individual kept getting worse, was in about 10 out of 10 pain on all those medications. Currently, from age 27 to 36, for the last nine years, this individual has the least amount of pain they've ever had in their life. It fluctuates between a zero out of 10 to a two out of 10 on a daily basis. In addition to that, for the last nine years, this individual has been on no prescription medications. So you can see, the time on no prescription medications has exceeded the time this person was on prescription medications. And again, this individual keeps getting better. Why? Because he gave his body the building blocks at the source. Healed the gut lining, stopped the chronic inflammation, supported the mitochondria for enhanced energy production. And another thing this individual does is a specialized exercise program called foundation training. And what that does is strengthens the muscles of the back to support the spine with this individual's condition of ankylosing spondylitis. That is chronic inflammation of the spine. This is very supportive for that. Some people say it's too extreme what this individual has to do, whether that's the nutritional protocol, the supplements, the exercise. They say that is too extreme. Not if you've experienced that kind of pain where somebody can't walk on a daily basis, needs to take a chair to step to walk down a hallway, has to lay in bed because of chronic fatigue. When you experience that kind of pain and that kind of fatigue, nothing's too extreme. Why do I know that? Because this was my case. That was my story. I took you guys through a journey of what I went through for the last 18 years. And over a decade, that is what my life was like. It was like in a prison cell of my own body with that chronic pain, with that chronic fatigue. And today, my life is like this. And that's what it feels like to overcome that chronic pain, to overcome that chronic fatigue. And that's part of my mission of what I'm doing is encourage individuals, if they support their body at the most basic level, they do not have to be on these prescription medications with all these side effects, and they can experience success. Thank you.